All right. Um, I didn't really mention this. Well, I did. In a lecture, I talked about the three different types of cases. And uh, basically, you can divide them up then into two. They're in the light combing. Uh, one type, you can tap apart with a hammer like we did. The other type, best of luck to you. You're going to need a big old freaking sledgehammer if you think you're going to get it apart like that. They do not come apart like that. They weren't designed to come apart like that. Yours was designed to come apart like that. The other style must be pressed apart. And you use these, uh, the ST122-2 crankcase stud plates. And what you have right there, I, don't, I didn't put the green. Oh, I think that's what they're probably selling is that bolt right there for $4,000, to be honest with you. Because uh, it's, the, it's the stud. And they're just selling the stud. Um, so what you do is you take these studs and they screw over your existing studs. So now you get a much longer stud sticking out. And then you place this plate on your engine. Well, but behind here are your other studs. The studs are behind here. And what you do is when you tighten this nut down right there, it presses the plate in against the studs that, are, that you would normally tap on. So instead of tapping, this presses on all of them at the same time. You do on both sides of the engine. And uh, boy, I can't even tell you the number of times where um, our, our engine machine shop was actually rather small. I mean, it was good for one to two guys at the most to work in. And, uh, but I had you know, a little man door here and a little roll-up door right here, a sliding door. So I always had you know, summer and sliding door. How many people would pull up to the ramp and back right up there and, hey, can I can help you? Yeah, you know, this case is stuck and we can't get it apart. And they would pull out the back of their truck with just screwdrivers and pry bars just sticking out like a porcupine. Well, that, of course, ruined the, uh, the mating surface where that silk thread is going to go. That's a resurface and line bore. And even, what, 10, 20 years ago when I was doing it, that was $1,000 plus. Dollars. So imagine it's two to $3,000 now of damage. So I wouldn't want them to know my trade secrets, so I'd tell them to come back in an hour or two and I'd have it done, and I would just take it in the back room and use the plates. Or, nice. or I'd, yes, I'd do it in front of them. I don't, I don't remember. This is what you got to have. Like, oh, I get it. Do, with that uh, stud, would you still need, like, a big... Or, or it's easy, yeah. simple. Uh, half inch breaker bar with the right right tool. Yeah. So. So yes, if you cannot tap it apart, do not try to tap it apart. I mean, if it doesn't come, it ain't. It's not going to come. It just doesn't work that way. All right. So we talk about bearings. We got our plane bearing, right? Yes. Now the other type is the anti-friction type. Anti-friction type. Well, they come in two different flavors, I guess you will. Well, a few. There's the roller. The roller. Let me see. We got the roller. There we go. There's our anti-friction type. We have the roller type. Right there. We have the ball type. And the tapered roller type. So we'll keep that in mind. So there's the roller, roller, ball, ball, taper. The thing I hate about the taper is they come like that. So you have the race, which is the this part here, and the bearing here. But in bearing parlance, it is a cup and a cone. And you have to try to remember which one is the cup and which one's the cone. I believe this is the cup and this is the cone because the cup receives the thing. So. Or you can just order by part number. Well, so, oh, is that the cup or the cone? Oh, just give me the damn part number. How often do you place races comparing the two? Uh, like the paper I was just going to say, the wheel bearings. How often? Well, if I'm working in a production shop, uh, once a week. <laughs> Reasonably often. My own airplane, I've already done it at least once or twice. All right, anti-friction type. We've got the roller. Roller came in two different types. They was the straight 
um, and that is used for radial loads. Used for radial loads. And I'm going to move over. That's okay. Mm -hmm. And we have the tapered, which is used for radial or thrust. Which is why you see them used on aircraft tires. Because one, it's going around, and two, it tends to want to have a side load one way or the other, and that takes that side load. So, radial thrust. And that uses the inner and outer race. So it uses inner and outer race. Let's see radial. Inner and outer race. And we have the ball. Oops, that'd be B, B out there. The ball, that is the least amount of friction. Can be used for thrust or radial loads. It uses an inner and outer race. plus a ball retainer. If it's a thrust type, a thrust type uses a deep ball groove. So it's a deeper groove for the ball to run into because it's taken that, um, that groove and it's not a symmetrical groove, so um, you, so it uh, may have only one side. Let me see. I want to say that. I'll just put may have a thrust side. May have yeah, only one thrust thrust side, and that's the deeper groove. So you got to make sure you put it going the right way so that it's carrying the thrust. Put it backwards, it won't work. So where are we going to see these anti-friction? How come you don't have anti-friction in there? It's not high enough force time. Yeah. Yeah, they're big, they're heavy. Uh, mostly used in radial engines. Um, or very high horsepower engines. I'm not aware of any opposed aircraft engine that uses them for main or rod bearings. It's not uncommon to see uh, ball type bearings. Well, you have them in magnetos, you've seen that. Um, some accessory drive components may have it, but not on the crankshaft or camshaft. Oh, good segue. Small, small bearings uh, used commonly, commonly in accessories. Generators, alternators, magnetos, that kind of thing. So if we talk about, I said they're used like mostly in radial engines, high horsepower, definitely radial engines are going to be using uh, 
anti-friction bearings. Engine like this, we most likely have three of them. So we'd have one right back in here, one kind of in this section, so it's on both. I swear I've got a, got a picture of that, let me see. Don't. How come they hold up to a higher horsepower? Because as you mentioned, it's used in the high horsepower in the radial engine. Wouldn't you not want that in your engine? Because it is a little, if it crumbles and falls apart, you've got a yep. little metal ball. Yep, yes, you do. Bouncing around your engine. Yes, you do. And so, right here, I believe this is a Continental 220 crankshaft. And so, you'd have one back here on the rear, and that would be what kind do you think it would be? Uh, ball. Um, ra strictly a radial load here. Yeah, radial. Or roller. Ro so it would be roller. Strictly a radial load here. So it would be a roller. roller. And then what you're not seeing is the one that goes up front, which would be a, which would be a deep, deep groove ball for the thrust bearing. So we can go back to here. So the one that goes in this cage right here would be the ball bearing for thrust. This one would be roller. Next one would be roller. So roller, roller, deep groove ball thrust. And yes, one of the things I learned because I worked on Stearman's a lot was when doing an annual on a Stearman after when you do you uh, um, check the oil screen, check the oil. We always pull, they have a very small sump. It only holds a quart or so in between the lower cylinders is take out that drain plug and drain it and then take a magnet, and stick it in there and run your magnet all over the place and pull it out. Make sure that you don't have a little ball sticking on there. <laughs> so, yeah. All right, let me see. Da, da, da. Okay, I guess that's all about. Did I ever pull it out and have a ball on the end? No, I didn't. Shucks. All right, let's talk about crankshafts. Wow, well, what's the purpose of the crankshaft? Yep. Converts. Reciprocating motion, very good. Reciprocating motion, a piston, and rod, and connecting rod, also called a con rod, con rod, to rotary motion. They are forged, forged of extremely strong. steel alloy of a 4340 so I'm told I don't know if I need to write this but light combing crankshafts are heated to 1200 degrees Fahrenheit for 24 hours and then checked for run out any crankshafts that are bent are placed under a hydraulic ram while they're that heat hot and pressed within two minutes of removal of the oven so they heat them up incredibly hot. So you can bend them. So you can bend them. And that's <laughs> how they do it. So they're forged and they're, they're, they're really ugly looking. It's like you're not even sure what the heck that is. And then they machine them down into what they're supposed to be. So they are nitride hardened. And if you're asking, well, why does light combing heat it for 1,200 degrees for 24 hours? I'm almost positive it's for the nitriding here. So nitride nitride hardened there are a lot of things in an engine that are nitride hardened and what that is and i'll write this one out because it's kind of interesting it's nitrogen from this word a n h y d r o u s anhydrous ammonium 
or ammonia, gas, is forced to penetrate the surface. Um, of steel by exposing the part for about 40 hours at 975 degrees Fahrenheit. So that matches with what I've got from Lycoming. It's 40 hours at 975 at Lycoming School. They said, oh, I didn't write it. Uh, 24 hours at 1200, so close enough. I think that's what they're doing They're nitriding it. Anything that is not to be nitrided, anything that is not to be nitrided, is coated with copper. Uh, let's see what else I got. Some areas, okay, some areas, some areas, not nitrided, are, for light combing, uh, prop flange, That's like coming. Um, hanger blades. That is where you hang counterweights on, uh, on the crankshaft. And gear pad. And this night triting has about a depth, a depth of about. 0 0.010. 0. I think it's hanger blades and gear pad. Nitriding has a depth of about 0 0.010. 0. I don't think it's, and that's max. That's the max depth. So you're really not going to quite get that. Um, I've read stuff that it's more along the lines of half that. From the, from the air surface into the... From the surface part. in. All right, so here's the thing about nitriding. And it's not just like some gee whiz information. I mean, if you're going to work on these things, nitriding is something you have to understand and deal with. So first of all, the takeaways are, well, crankshafts, when they come out of the factory. Yeah, go ahead. If you have to resurface your crankshaft, or if it's, you know, it's going to be a turn down so that it, because of, whatever you have to redo this process that's what i was going to say so thank you so crankshafts when they come out of the factory they're standard all right when the, a new crankshaft is standard it's just the way they are if it can't be standard i think they're going to throw it away and start another one so you get a crankshaft and you it's in operation now like i said before light combing was great because light combing you'd uh, you get an engine it would, you know, run until you had to take it apart for whatever reason, overhaul, prop strike, whatever. You take it out, you measure it, and you say, well, it's really worn, you know, through the new limits. And it's kind of towards the end of its uh, service limit for standard. But light combing used to let you polish it right into minus three. So I had a crankshaft polisher and you just a little bit of polishing with a fresh belt. We take it down just a little bit more, and boom, you're right inside brand new limits for minus three. All right, and they, let, they would let you do that. And then you, they'd let you run it all the way through minus three, and then you can go to minus six. But to go from to six, back in the day, you had to send it out for re-nitriting. They would actually, uh, instead of polish, they'd probably use a grinder and a little more uh, um, controlled process. Otherwise, it, polishing, you can actually get the imperfections, it'll follow them. So they would grind it. Or you can go from six 
to 10. And of course, when you went from six to 10, you had to renitride. Well, the new service instruction says, hey, we want you to renitride each time. So, um, but you know, back in my day, I, I could take it to three, no problem. But then to go to six, I would send it out. And so I would send it out to these places. And then, um, you know, I'd do the polish and spec, measure non-destructive testing. Okay, this is a good crankshaft, just needs to be ground under, send it off. And then I would get a call. Hey man, real sorry, Kevin. Uh, we lost your crank in nitriding. Well, I'll use a flashlight and look under the table because sometimes they roll on the table. Like, what do you mean you lost it? It's like, well, it, it cracked in nitriding. Well, I didn't really know what the process was. I didn't ask, well, how does it crack? Now, you know, now I understand it. And I'm like, oh, you soaked it at, you know, a thousand degrees for a couple of days and it sagged and cracked or cracked or whatever. But it, it happened from time to time. So uh, now Continental is very different. They don't have the standard 3610. It's standard 10. So you get two shots at it. Um, light combing, like I said here, they do not nitride their prop flanges. They're soft. They will bend. Continental nitrides the whole thing. Although, uh, you know, uh, Continental, their biggest engine, the IO550, the prop flange is only about that big around. They're very small, where light combing is much, much bigger. But Continental nitrides the whole thing, and um, they crack. So you got to watch those. They'll crack much easier. So without nitriding, it's not as hard. It's more malleable. It's bendable. Uh, with nitriding, it just it doesn't want to bend. It just cracks. It gets too brittle. Uh, so yeah. So okay. So let's talk about that. So now you can see that if the depth is a maximum of ten, and that really it's a max. It's more like five. It makes sense now why Lycoming would say, okay, we can let you polish to three, but you can't go to six. There's not much nitriding left, so you got to renitrite. Well, now they want you to renitrite all the way through. Um, okay, but let's talk about cylinders, even though we haven't got there yet. Um, most manufacturers nitride their cylinders. Now, Lycoming is funny. They make a big deal. Oh, these are nitriding. Um, Continental's like, they're cylinders. Uh, of course they're nitrided. Why, why would we do something other than that? They don't, they're not marked. They don't call it that. They don't make a thing about it. It's just, it's their cylinders. And of course they're nitrided. Uh, but light coming's like, oh no, these are plain steel, but these are nitrided. We're going to paint blue on them to tell you they're nitrided. Um, so you can do the same thing with these, these cylinders with uh, like um, the reverse with Continental. Continental's like, all right, we've got standard, we got five under, then we got, you know, five under, it's just the same thing, it's the same piston, just, uh, you get bigger rings. Um, light combing is like standard, then 10 under, or, or sorry, 10 over, bore it 10 over. Well, if you've got a nitrided cylinder and you bore it 10 thousandths over, guess what kind of cylinder you now have? Not a nitrated, Not a nitrated cylinder. You still call it that, you still stripe it like that, but, you know, do you, do you think there's any nitriding left? I do not think so. So, something to think about. Light coming wherever, and they say they call you up and say it's cracked. Is it the cylinder? Warranty the crank. The crank, yeah. Is it? Oh, well, we didn't send it to light coming. Um, who did I use? Well, I used to use ECI when ECI was owned by ECI. Now they're owned by Continental. They were a fantastic company. They had a great machine work. Um, I'll tell you a story that wasn't so fantastic, but they fixed it. Um, did they just say it's? Up to the aircraft owner to buy a new crank. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's the risk of risk of the owner. Wait, what? It's the owner's risk. It's your risk to send it off. Yeah, they don't take responsibility for that. For their process, that they track your crankshaft. Yeah. Does the pilot usually is usually cool with it? Because you understand. No, they're not cool. The new crankshafts <laughs> a lot of money. <laughs> Let me take it. I'm going to repair it. Oops, broke it. Your problem. Does that usually mean it has <laughs> some type of wear that caused it to, to break? No, I don't know if it's an imperfection that's pre-existing okay. or what the deal is. But it's not like that. It's not like, you know, I guess that's what hey, I, I want you to overhaul my engine. Okay. And, you know, hey, sorry, your engine broke. Well, what? No, it's, at least in my shop it was. And I would sit you down and say, okay, here's, here's your, your options. You know, we would like to grind your crankshaft to six under, um, or we can buy you a new crankshaft now, or we can buy a serviceable one. These are, you know, um, that's standard. Uh, if we do send your crankshaft out for nitriding, just be aware that uh, it could fail the process. It's, it's a bit of an invasive process and it could fail. 
and then you would have to buy another one. Like yes. Yeah, you, you signed the waiver. You signed the waiver. Okay. Um, well, since I brought up EC, I'm telling too many stories. I'm not going to get the end of anything. Um, let me see. Bearings, bearings, bearings. Crankshaft. All right. So, uh, what do we have here? Light coming crankshaft, which we've talked all about. What is this piece right here? Slinger ring. Yeah. Technically, if you have a pusher prop, then this is the thrust face. Push means from the back. Yep. Yep, because it's going that way. So this is the rear of the airplane. It's going that way. It is going to be pushing against this right here, and that's your thrust face. So are those known to fail MVP in track because of mm. a different set of thrusts? I've never, I don't think I have a lot of experience building pusher planes enough to say that but it sure is awful thin compared to this over here all right so we've got some parts here this little right there is called the fillet or the fillet I guess um, crank webs um, obviously these are the journals right here that's a journal Um, let me see. Or crank pin. Actually, I'm sorry. Just look at notes. I should call this the journal and this is the crank pin. I like that better. Um, I call this little area the cheek. The cheek. Keep in mind that light combing also is very nice. This is one. This is two, this is three, this is four. If this were a continental, this would be one, this would be two, this would be, that the color didn't work, that'd be, <laughs> that'd be three, and this would be four. It goes backwards, because continental cylinders, number one's in the back. All right, what else I got here? Hey, there's continental. Can you tell the differences by looking at them? Slingery? I've worked on them enough. I don't know, that sounded like, not like I wanted it to sound, sorry. It's like, <laughs> you two will eventually far surpass, in a very short period of time, all of you will surpass me in knowledge with what you're doing and uh, will be able to teach me more than I've ever taught you. So it's not like some sort of, you know, I'm better than you. It's just, I've had the experience very soon. You will have different experience that will, that will be very interesting to me to learn what you've done. So... I just happen to have done this for a living. Um, what can I tell? Uh, number one, the color. <laughs> Two, the double, um, like, slinger rings. It's just kind of a light combing thing. And it looks like a light combing. Um, that's a small continental, single slinger ring. They tend to um, use the gold, um, what do you call that? that um, CAD plating. CAD plating here. So that's like an O200 or C85 or something like that. Ah, yes. Things you need to know. Lycoming. There's not even a spot for you to write this down. There's just so much good information. So Lycoming had a change, thankfully. And we can see these oil holes here. Let's go to something red. And one of your projects is to identify how oil flows through an engine. And so you can see an oil hole here. There's one down there. Uh, there's one right there. And there's going to be one over here too. And so we got to pressure oil this engine. So pressure oil is going to come from, a, from the galleries in the crankcase through holes. And that hole is going to line up right about there. And another one's going to come through the crankcase and run up there, another one here, all on the same side, even though I wrote my arrows on different sizes. So what that does then, these holes line up with something. Well, if you were to look at it, you would see a tube runs just like this, right through there. And it's going to go up to here to a little hole, and that's going to pressure oil that crank pin. And this one is going to come up this way and do the same thing. And you won't be able to see this on your crankshafts, 
But on a new modern one, you'd look in there and you'd see a steel tube in there, you know, a little straw. You never, never, ever take those out. Never, never, never. And of course, this one over here lines up over here. Pressure feeds that. And uh, I'm pretty sure, let me think, this one's got to come. There's, I think there's another hole right there. Uh, and this way that pressure feeds this one like that. So um, we got pressure oil. We also have, yeah, I'm pretty sure there's one right there. And uh, we've got another one here because um, a lot of times we'll put a plug right here and separate those two. This is the oil off of the governor that goes this way out to the prop. It's got to have a way to get oil to the prop, which we'll talk about um, in another class. But anyway, we've got pressure oil, pressure oiling, all of those things right there and those little straws. Got it? Got it? So oil comes through here, pressure feeds this bearing, and it drips out and splashes around. And so that's just, that's the end of its cycle right there. Drips out, goes down the oil sump. So there's our pressure oiling. Well, long time ago, Lycoming didn't have these tubes like this. They actually put a thing in here. Well, you still have the hole, so I'm gonna get rid of this. Let's see if I can do this. They did it different. Um, they ran, so they had a hole here and they put a plug in here and the plug was kind of shaped like this. So that you had some space right here. And that formed a chamber that then had another hole that was drilled out that went this way. So same idea, but if you had the hole like this, and I'm sorry, I just screwed that up. That does not go there. That goes here. <laughs> that goes there. So oil is pressure fed into here. And then that little plug, if you will, is called a sludge tube. And what it does is it allows oil to fill up this chamber in here. And that little chamber then starts collecting sludge in here. And that sludge is all the byproducts from combustion and the lead, and it's nasty. Is it nasty? You guys messed with it last year, right? Okay, so they have these sludge tubes in there. Well, without the sludge tubes in there, what happens is um, no sludge tube. The oil is fed into the... Did I just screw that up? Sludge tubes. Yeah, they do go out here. I was right to begin with. I'm sorry. They're sludge tubes. Anyway, you have sludge tubes out here. Without the sludge tubes out here um, what happens is the oil is not yeah it's out here I'm very sorry that was right the first time sludge tubes are out here without those sludge tubes um, the oil is pumped up into here and just runs out the holes on the end and there's no way to pressure feed it because it's, uh, it kind of creates the cap for it let me go grab something tubes you have them in all of your crankshafts they are not reusable although I were using here in class they're actually pressed into those, those crank rows and you see it's it's sealed right here on the crank shaft and this little space right here oil comes in and it fills that cavity up and then comes out this end without it you just have the oil coming in and then instead of filling this up and being pressure fed this way it fills this, it doesn't fill anything up, just comes into a hollow tube and leaks out the end. So you got the sludge tube. So what does a sludge tube do? Well, a sludge tube is like a centrifuge. It's spinning and it separates the nastiness. And so here you have sludge. So you are welcome to touch the sludge. You better wash your hands out. Because this stuff is really dried up. But I think you get the idea. Yeah, this is all dry, but you have to play with sludge. Sludge is wonderful. Sludge gets into the front of the crankshaft, no matter what kind of crankshaft you have. Fills up this tube right here. Well, Lycoming had some real problems with the sludge buildup in here. That sludge, because it's a centrifuge, is forced to the 
inside, di inside diameter to the outside. So it packs up in there and moisture gets trapped underneath it and doesn't go out. Well, what happens if you trap moisture against a hardened steel piece? Uh, hardened uh, steel. It starts to rust. Well, you don't know that until it rusts through and that part falls off. So Lycoming had a real bad problem uh, with this, this uh, interior pitting. Now, I don't know, have anybody in the medical industry in here? Because this starts to get funny. No? If you know anything about medical and stuff like that, you can follow along. So they had this problem with uh, this pitting on the inside. And so what they wanted you to do, or what they still want you to do, is you pull the plug out of the front and you go in there and you do this inspection. Well, once you do the inspection, you're supposed to put this stuff on there called urethra bond. Well, urethra is a thing you pee out of, okay? So I don't know why they got that name, but it's, it's, it's this aluminized paint. So you have to clean it all out, all the sludge, you got to treat it, got to get it perfectly clean, which is no fun at all. And then you put this urethra bond on it. And uh, then once you've done that, I kid you not, you write PID on here, which also stands for pelvic inflammatory disease, which is something that uh, you don't want to get. Um, and then just to add one more insult to injury, then when you're all done, you got to put this plug back on here. And that plug part number is an STD1211. Uh, <laughs> so, I don't know, man. This is somebody's sense of humor. Or, well, I don't know. I think I'm making all that up because the bond is probably not urethra bond. It's probably some form of that. And PID stands for painted inside diameter. And STD stands for a standard part. And uh, Lycoming uses a lot of STD part numbers. But I do think that that is rather hilarious if you're into that kind of thing. And I am. So, all right. What's that? <laughs> All right, so, see, nitride hard. Okay, so that's that's our crankcases, right, or crankshafts right there. I don't know what else I can tell you about that. Uh, the sludge tubes that overhaul have to come out. If you're going to do any kind of blasting, they should come out. Honestly, any time you take the crankshaft out, those sludge tubes should come out. I just don't have enough to keep putting them back in and out and in and out for you guys. So that's why we don't do a whole lot. It's... Um, not a great idea to do what we're doing and not pull the sludge tubes out and clean out inside there and then put them back in. So. Are they expensive or just hard to come by? So um, maybe I'm just too lazy to order them. I don't know. I was having a, a hard time getting parts for a long time. So, yeah. but um, anyway, the sludge tubes. Uh, let's see. We get into that. When we get into that. Um, let's see. What's that? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Actually, I in my shop I had a little tool that went here with a with a rod. Just tink, 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 tink. Here I just use a socket that fits right inside there with a long extension. You just tap, tap, tap. Comes right out. And when you put them in, there's a service instruction. Of course, it tells you exactly how far they go in and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. All right. Uh, see, that's for another topic. All right. So let me see. So nitride, okay, so they got that. Other things about, so opposed, opposed type engine aircraft or inline um, or V engines, all that, they're all single piece um, or single piece. I Meaning it's one piece, can't take it apart. I mean, you can take it apart, you can't put it back together. Uh, radial engines, radial engines can be, can be two or more pieces. Let's back up. Let's go forward. Oops, too far. There's a crank. All right. So right there, that's a, uh, inside, I think, like a Continental 220. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, two Continental 220, the W670. 
And um, here's the crankshaft. It is two pieces. And that is how you get this onto there. Because that is one piece. So if that doesn't split, then this has to split. So that goes on there, and then this piece goes on there. And that's kind of fun to do um, in a weird way, because you think about it, this shaft has to be perfectly in line with that shaft. If it's not, you're going to get some serious run out. And so this simply clamps onto that. It's not keyed. It's This is a round shaft, and that's a round shaft. And so if you don't get these two fixed counterweights exactly where they're supposed to be, then they're kind of off this, and the whole thing kind of wobbles and runs around. Um, not that you really care, but see that slot right there? That's for a keyway. So you pound a key into that one and that one. So you get to, you build up, oh, this is, you build up your master rod. So you got to build it up and all these uh, knuckle pins are pressed into here. So you get this whole thing built up and it's rather heavy. Then you put it onto there. The radial. It's radial. Then you put the back half of the crankshaft on. You can see it's cut out a little bit right there for a bolt to go through. You bolt that and you put the keyway, then you tighten it up. Then you put it on a stand and you do a run out check on it. And you got to hold all these rods while somebody else is spinning it because they're flopping around. You got to make sure that you have no run out. If you get a little bit of run out, you loosen the bolt and you move the counterweights a little tiny bit and you try it again. And then you do this one, you try again. And you keep trying to try and try until you get it perfect. Then you torque it down, then you're done. Then you start building the engine up from there. But uh, yeah, multiple pieces. Good times. I don't know why I have that. It's just, there it is. There's a radio. I think I said something about the crankcase being a one power section being one piece. They're all two pieces. I don't know why I was thinking that. Even when I said it, I thought, I don't think that's right. But no, I know I'm wrong. Uh, what else? All right. Not to that. All right. Uh, radials, okay, um, most of them are hollow. Um, I don't know of any of them that are really solid. You have to have them hollow because um, it reduces weight, provides oil power at this. They're, they're, they have a hollowness to them. One, it reduces weight. Uh, two provides oil passage and we need a lot of oil to go up front to the prop so the whole prop the whole front has to be hollow um, not all of them are I've seen some solid ones but if you run a solid one up front then you cannot run a constant speed prop unless it's electric or some other driven um, provides sludge tube Sludge, uh, sludge tube chambers. So I made some notes here, which I already told you. Sludge is mostly lead from combustion. Um, sludge is slung to outside, oops, o -U -T outside, outside, let's try that again, I'm thinking of two things. Not to the outside of the engine, to the outside of any hollow surface is what I'm talking about. Um, outside of any hollow surface. Um, by centrifugal force. The crankshaft hollow surface? Yes. It's like a centrifuge. Had, actually has a problem. With sludge, we see that kind of problem with the sludge. Um, trapping moisture. Um, 
causing pitting and crank failure. I don't know why Continental didn't have this problem. It's not like they're the same thing. And that was all about SB530. And I'll kind of clue you into something. So I often talk about, especially like combing, service bulletins or service instructions. You also have service letters. So a service letter might be something like, hey, we're just letting you know that uh, we've started producing this new engine or, you know, we've got this new oil available or something like that. It's just like, wow. Uh, service instruction often tells you how to do something, put the case together, how to select oil, how to uh, figure out the right bearings, you know, all kinds of different stuff. Uh, very helpful information. A service bulletin is almost like an airworthiness directive. When there's a problem, it's a service bulletin. So, service bulletin, problem. Um, yeah, some mains are solid, some are hollow. Let me see. Ah, oh, let's write that. Some. So on a service bulletin, do they give a uh, hour interval? Oh, yeah. Time? Yeah, usually. You know what that is? Um, the service bulletin, I don't remember. It's been out for so long that there wouldn't be an engine out there that wouldn't be applicable to. The AD, last I read it, was only applicable to 160 horsepower and above. I, I, I had my airplane for 20 years before. No, once it's got the PID uh, stamped on it, I don't think it's not a repetitive. Okay. But uh, the stuff when I did it was all readily available. It's like any AMP could do it. It wasn't a big deal. Uh, some front mains are solid, some are hollow. Some front mains are solid, some hollow. That's the front mains. Um, let me see. I don't need to write all this. It's just not something you'll know or, or remember. Uh, I'll tell you though, because it's you know it's fun to know. Looking back at a crankshaft, we're gonna find a crankshaft. Here we go. And I told you there was like a little something right there. That's a terrible color. They actually have usually a a plug right there, and that plug could be open and it could be closed. If you've got the STD1211 plug right here, then that's for a fixed pitch propeller. That means the oil needs to get out this way, so that'll be open. But if I want to make this into a constant speed engine, then I remove this plug, so that plug goes away, and then you have to plug this up so that the oil pressure goes that way. And you should desludge every 500 hours according to Lycoming, so desludge every 500 hours. That's just a light coming thing. So apparently it's time to go. All right, let's get out of here.